Hello everyone, I am Dr. Abhishek Chaudhary and today I would like to discuss on a very uh, important topic but uh, it is relatively untouched and uh, that is tuberculosis. As a homeopath, as a doctor, as a homeopathic student, we don't often see cases of tuberculosis coming in our clinic, getting treated. Even when you see in a seminar or in any presentation, any case study, you will not find cases of tuberculosis very often. They are relatively less. But why is it so? You know, it, it forces us to ponder on this question that whether we are not capable of treating tuberculosis. Is there any scope why we have to uh, refer cases of tuberculosis to homeopathy? Why we as a homeopath, many of some of the uh, experienced homeopaths even, they think that we should just use homeopathy as a complementary treatment along with anti-tubercular treatment. Now if you look at any repertory, if you have with you complete repertory or Murphy's repertory or any other modern repertory like synthesis, if you look at the clinical section, if you have just open it and if you open the clinical section and you, if you search in clinical section tuberculosis, you will find around 500 remedies. and many great remedies, many remedies in first grade that you can see here and remedies that we know that are mentioned in various therapeutic books, remedies like Phosphorus, Silesia, the tuberculinosodes, like tuberculinum, bacillinum. the calcarea group the whole Kali group, of course. So we have such a wide range of remedies. So we have these vast selection of remedies. But still, why we are skeptical? why we have to refer and the patient himself don't trust homeopathy. Why we have to send cases of tuberculosis? There are many reasons for that. One of the main reason is not having a sound knowledge of clinical medicine. The knowledge of medicine is definitely lacking in ourselves and we have to accept this as a homeopath. We all know the standard of homeopathy in the country. It is improving but the standard of education is definitely, definitely have not improved at all. In fact, it has deteriorated. In the past, we'll, we can say in past 10 years. So we have to get ready. We have to uh, make ourselves prepared. We have to trust. You know, it's really ironic that we are skeptical in cases of tuberculosis. We are even, you know, some physicians are even skeptical in cases of uh, malaria. They forget about the 
root, the origin story of homeopathy, the Sinkona Park experiment. Similarly, we forget in case of tuberculosis, we forget the story of Boniosin. We all know the story of Boniosin, that why he was diverted and took on the path to become such a great homeopath. Because he himself experienced the power of true healing. Now he was treated by uh, one of his colleague, one of his friend for tuberculosis by some doses of pulsatella. If you have repertory open with you, just see pulsatella is in first grade, of course. Today, what I am going to do is, I am going to focus on my understanding, I am going to focus on some tubercular no sorts, certain remedies and maybe next time in the next discussion. Maybe we will take this discussion a bit further. So now you can see, we all know about tubercular nosodes. I am not going to do a study of Materia Medica or, uh, you know, I am not going to teach you remedies that you all can do by yourself. But I'm going to I'm going to share with you what's my experience and my understanding in my uh, very short career. What I have learned, what I have grasped, and just if you have boric with you, we're going to look at some pathological aspect. Just open tuberculinum. You have boric with you in any form, either in software form or in the book form, both will do. So it is written in the first line that tuberculinum is indicated in renal affection, but the caution is necessary for where skin and intestine do not perform normally. Even high potencies are dangerous. It is of course uh, taken from Dr. Nabel's statement in chronic cystitis, brilliant and permanent result. So we see, in cases of glomerulonephritis, that we see very often nowadays, in children, in adults, and if you have studied glomerulonephritis, uh, the pathological aspect of it, pathologically it is divided into various subtypes. And we understand that it is autoimmune in origin. So allopathy, the modern medicine, don't have much answer for it, apart from giving steroids. The end result will be for kidney transplant. So we can always think of tuberculinum in cases like that or where there is a history of any kind of renal affection. Maybe a simple condition like renal polyps to a severe pathological condition like glomerulonephritis. We can definitely think about tuberculinum as a drug. He writes in the second paragraph of undoubted value in the treatment of incipient tuberculosis. Now, incipient is an old term, it means a beginning stage. In tuberculinum, if we look, even in, in, in Borix Materia Medica, which is 
in which Boric used to focus more on the pathological aspect. But even in this material, you can see it's a it's a, a very big, vast remedy. It has symptoms from head to foot and symptoms of mind. If we start to discuss about the mind aspect, the mental aspect of tuberculinum, it's going to take another uh, session, another lecture. Such a wonderful remedy it is. So the incipient stages. And he writes about the, of course he writes about the physical uh, makeup that is light complexion, narrow chested subjects. You can of course compare it with phosphorus. If you want to differentiate between the two, look for the physical generals. The physical generals you can easily differentiate between the two remedies of course on the mental generals as well and but you should be cautious that because phosphorus is again a tubercular remedy the tubercular miasm is in prominence in phosphorus in later stages in advanced stages the phosphorus constitution may look like tuberculin we will go in the detail uh, maybe next time in the comparative detail between the two remedies but right now just look at what he writes next you know when symptoms are constantly changing and well selected remedies fail to improve we have many remedies you know where it is indicated it is given that when well selected remedies fail to improve the first remedy that comes to our mind is sulfur it tends to produce a kind of reaction you know whenever there is a want of reaction whenever the well selected remedies are failing other remedy could be sorino another great remedy is opium whenever there is lack of reaction you know opium in case of opium you will find that there is no complaint you know patient is having a 102 fever i still remember a case uh, taught by one of my teacher he told me about this case of a young boy whose parents called him to their house said Oh, the, the, my, our son is suffering from very high fever, 103, 104 fever. Please come, sir. Please see him. Give him some medicine. When the doctor went to his house, when he reached his, uh, their house, he asked about the child, bring the child. And they said the child has went to play. So they waited. And when child came and he took the temperature, the temperature was 100, 300, 4. So, uh, in case like that, such a high fever, and there was no complaint, the child has went to play. So he gave opium and the fever come, came down. So you have to remember remedies like that. You know, cases always teach us and the main problem in our education system is that during college days, during when we do BHMS, when we do graduation, we, we are not exposed in, you know, some colleges, some good universities or colleges have that kind of infrastructure but in majority of colleges you will not find exposure to what cases and cases are the best way 
you know, when, once you have seen a case of a person and you have read for that case, read a remedy for that case or read organ for that case, we will never going to forget about that. Just reading for the exam on the other hand is very different. Okay, let's continue. And he writes, the cold is taken from slightest exposure. Many times a parent comes to you and say, sir, my child, uh, you know, he gets affected from cough, coriza, cold very often. You know, any change of weather. You know, slightly he, he take uh, uh, any kind of cold food, maybe a ice cream or just drink cold water and he gets suffer from cold, cough, coriza. And it is a great, it is a very big characteristic of the tubercular miasma. If you see in uh, repertory a rubric recurrent coriza in nose you will find this you will see you will not find tuberculinum here very interesting but you will find a remedy silesia and of course a great antisoric sulfur is there silesia is again a great anti tubercular drug If you read uh, about tuberculosis, if you read about silico tuberculosis, it's a kind of tuberculosis that is developed by long term inhalation of silica dust. The exact pathology to medical science is not known. There are some theories that why it develops, but the exact uh, mechanism is not known and the bacilli develops. The patient has not affected, not got in contact with any tubercular uh, in a patient. He was just inhaling the silica dust. And after a time, he is suffering from tuberculosis. That is called silico tuberculosis. You can read about it if you have uh, your practice of medicine book with you. It is given. But as a homeopathy student, we can understand, if you read the picture of uh, Silesia, you know, Silesia is again a very uh, big polycrest, but Silesia has a very prominent picture of tuberculosis. In cases where there is scar formation, you know, after the patient has healed, the gone foci, where, uh, if, if you have knowledge of pathology, you will know about what I am talking about. The Gon Fukai has healed. The patient is better now. The scarring is, uh, the scarring has happened. In cases like that, if the patient, if even though it is indicated, you should be careful in prescribing Silesia. It is experienced by one of our masters that Silesia tends to open up the scars, the old scars because it has the, uh, Silesia has the tendency to open up the scars and to heal it properly. Okay, let's come back to tuberculinum. So, if you go on and read tuberculinum, it's a very vast drug. There are majority of symptoms. And we should definitely understand the pathological aspect of tuberculinum. And in comparison, I would like your attention towards basilinum. Well, uh, another nosode, another tubercular nosode 
basal enum is prepared by maceration of the tubercular lung. The whole lung is macerated and this nosoid is prepared from that. It, is it was introduced by Burnett. And one of the main indication or you can say that in cases where you prescribe basal enum, in cases of tuberculosis, especially in cases of open tuberculosis in which the sputum is coming, you will find that after giving basal enum, the quality of sputum improves. What I mean by quality is that the quantity becomes less. The patient will tell you, now the sputum is not that viscid thick. There is no purulent, you know, not smelling now. The sputum, uh, after you had given me this remedy, the sputum is now very less in quantity. It has become more aerated. Aerated means you will find that bubbles or the lightness of a sputum, a kind of frothy nature you will find. And that is a healthy sign. It means that remedy has worked. Although you should be careful in cases of heart diseases that are associated with lung diseases. In that case, if frothy sputum is coming, that is, uh, that could be a sign of a heart trouble. But in case of tuberculosis, in case of open tuberculosis, in which there is lot of purulent sputum was coming, and you had given basal enum, and the sputum quality has increased, it has decreased in quantity, and it, it has become more aerated. It means you are in, on the right track. So he writes this, you can read it in uh, the first paragraph. Another great indication, uh, which is a non-tubercular indication, it is in case of tartar of teeth. Again, some people believe that uh, homeopathy in dental cases, you know, in dental cases, homeopathy works to a certain extent. We have to go to a dentist. And it is true in advanced cases when there is caries, the pain, and the, there is so much pain, we may have to take assistance of a dentist. But in obstinate cases, like cases of tartar, where we have to go to dentist for cleaning to break off the tartar. But you can always try basilin. It really favors the falling of tartar from the teeth. It's my personal experience uh, in cases of tartar. Apart from, you know, the patient has good oral hygiene and still he, he is developing that tartar on his teeth. One of the main uh, reason for development of tartar is that poor oral hygiene. But you will find that in, in, in patients who are brushing regularly, who had good oral hygiene, they also tend to develop sometimes tartar because that is their tendency that is their disposition to develop tartar. In cases like that, basilinum is a great, great remedy. And if you look at the rubric tartar, you will find another very good remedy that I have personally experienced is calculi renalis or calcarea renalis, which is prepared from the renal stone. And it is a first grade remedy if you look at the rubric tartar it's in first grade given in first grade and it is a wonderful remedy for the treatment of tartar i have tried it in repeated doses but your experience may differ according to the patient another non tubercular indication is ringworm for basilinum in obstinate cases of ringworm, you have tried remedies like sulfur, sorinum, petroleum, tellurium, whatever. 
and the patient is not improving, the itching is not going, you know, there is recurrency of ringworm. Just try basilinum. And it, he writes tubercular meningitis. So tubercular meningitis is not a common form of tuberculosis. The most common is of course pulmonary and then intestinal, but uh, tuberculosis can happen anywhere in the body, wherever they, whenever, wherever there is uh, a supply of uh, blood, wherever the, uh, the bacilli can reach, that part can get affected. And you can compare it with a very good drug. And that drug is iodoform. Let us look at iodoform in boric. And iodoform is almost a specific drug for tubercular meningitis. He writes in first line, should not be forgotten in the treatment of tubercular meningitis both as a local application to the head and internally. And of course, the comparison is basilin. <coughs> Sorry. So, iodoform. It is a great drug in cases of tubercular meningitis. Now, if you look at basilinum, basilinum is very much indicated on the upper half of the body. But if you look at another basilinum, that is basilinum testium. Now, basilinum testium is prepared from the testicles, the uh, testicles which are affected by tuberculosis and it is indicated on the lower half of the body. So, in cases of intestinal tuberculosis or tuberculosis of lower part of the body, maybe knees or lower extremities, you can think of basilinum testium, maybe as an intercurrent remedy or maybe as a symptomatic remedy. We have many other remedies regarding tuberculosis. Right now I have only touched, you know, barely scratched the surface, but I am not going to teach you each and every uh, uh, remedy regarding tuberculosis. I will teach you what I have experienced in my understanding in cases of tuberculosis and we will look at some other drugs. Next time, maybe we will look at some drugs. You no, know, right now we have discussed about the incipient stage. Next time, maybe we will discuss about the later stages or the end stages of tuberculosis. What we can do in end stages of tuberculosis? What drugs we have that can help to palliate or to, or to ameliorate cases which are hopeless. We have such a great pathy and such a great uh, armamentarium of remedies. And we should remember, dear to be wise, if we have knowledge, if we are good in our skills, if we are confident in our skills, We can definitely give good results in cases of tuberculosis. We can develop faith in patients. We can bring back the cases of multi-drug resistant TB, which are almost hopeless in, in allopathy, which have to take very high doses, which produces a lot of side effects or are uh, hepatotoxic drugs. In cases like that, we can bring the patient to a stage from where the allopathy may start working again in cases of MDRTB or we can continue our own pathy.
So, for today, this will be it. If you have any suggestions, if you have any questions, kindly leave it in the comment section. If you have liked the video, just press the like button and suggest me that what more topics you want to uh, discuss on whether it is repertory or materia medica or organ I will try to touch all three in upcoming lectures as well I will give you a slight hint along with the clinical knowledge along with materia medica along with organ we will take a collaborative approach towards learning let's hope to see you in the next video